we'll start so we can maximize the time we have with uh, Bill Easterly. I'm uh, extremely uh, happy to announce uh, Bill Easterly, who is here uh, to talk to us about development theories and the immigration crisis in the US and EU. Uh, Bill has uh, a recent book called The Tyranny of Experts, uh, Economists, Dictators, and the Forgotten Rights of the Poor, uh, which came out in March 2014. Uh, I very much like the book, and since the book came out, uh, we uh, have really wanted to have uh, Bill come here to Princeton and talk about his work. So again, I'm extremely glad that uh, we, could, we could manage that. Um, Bill uh, Easterly is professor of uh, economics at New York University, where he is also the co-director of the NYU Development uh, Research Institute. Uh, before uh, joining NYU, uh, Bill was working at the World Bank in the research uh, group. And uh, prior to that, he got his PhD in economics from MIT. Um, there are many ways, of course, to uh, describe Bill's work. It, it, it spans a very wide area. He's written three books, uh, published numerous uh, academic articles in the top journals. So I won't go into those details. Maybe I'll just, if I have to say a few minutes on, on Bill, and I hope he doesn't mind this comparison. Uh, we usually think of economics in terms of right and left, and there are economists like maybe freshwater, saltwater, and things like that. And usually, someone like Frederick Hayek is associated with the with, with people on the conservative side, and, and and perhaps Amartya Sen with people on the on, on on the left. But I think there is a common core uh, if you uh, read the work of either Hayek or Sen, and that common core is where I see Bill also. Uh, belong, which is this idea that when we think of economics or when we think of, a, of a, the economic society more generally, the most important aspect perhaps is not capital, labor, and what goes into the production function, more things of that sort, but there's actually something even more fundamental that economists need to take seriously. This is what for Hayek was this question of freedom, which he thought was so important that it was the most important attribute that he cared about. And the same thing with Amartya Sen, and he talks about development uh, in the modern context, and he, you know, he, he talks about development being defined as how much freedoms it can give to the population that is undergoing that process. So I see Bill very much in that tradition of both Hayek and, and Amartya Sen, uh, that he talks about the importance of these issues, and his new book is very much uh, along the same lines. Um, so with that very quick and brief introduction, I would Welcome, Bill, to give his uh, presentation. Bill is going to talk about for, for roughly 45 minutes. After that, we'll open up for questions and answers. And again, thank you very much, all of you, for coming here tonight. Thank you, Atif, for that very nice introduction. Uh, let me do a sound check. And those of you in the back, if you cannot hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> if, you can, if you can hear me, raise your hand in the back. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this, this talk is based on a, a chapter from the book that Atif so kindly uh, promoted for me, The Tyranny of Experts. It has a chapter on migration. And then some further, further kind of development since the book was published. And what we're going to talk about is sort of the relationship between the debate that uh, I've been involved in for a long time and many other development economists are involved in, the debate on foreign aid. We've been having this really heated debate on foreign aid and we sort of, a lot of us didn't realize until a lot later that we were also having a debate about migration at the same time that we're having a debate about foreign aid. And that's the idea that I want to try to get across to you t today, that the, these debates do not stay within one policy area. They spill from one area into the other in very unexpected and, and tricky ways. And so let me start off talking about kind of the big picture development theories as they affect our views of aid and migration. So first, let's talk about aid and development theories. The, uh, the classic model of, of development in which is sort of the most favorable model for having a really big effect of aid on poverty and development is a sort of poverty trap model in which poor people are trapped in a vicious circle of poverty and malnutrition and disease and illiteracy and conflict and violence and all these things are reinforcing each other and there's sort of like there are these sort of easy, simple technical fixes that are available for these problems, 
uh, but poor people cannot afford to pay for them, and so they remain stuck in this vicious circle. But if only some of it outside sort of funding or financing became available to, for these simple technical fixes, then you would be able to kind of pretty easily get out of a poverty trap, <coughs> solve all these things. So it's a, what we could call like a very technocratic solution that you just need to get a, a number of very simple technical fixes for these problems and bang, you're, you've solved poverty. And that was, that's sort of been the appealing message behind a lot of the advocacy for more aid and more donations to, to NGOs is that it's, it's not that hard. There are these you know, things like, say, malnutrition. Malnutrition is partly a shortage of, of essential vitamins. So say vitamin A deficiency, there's a very simple tablet uh, that uh, has a lot of vitamin A, vitamin A capsules. Just take vitamin A capsules, which take, uh, cost a few pennies per dose, and you've solved one of the facets of malnutrition, and then you've, you assemble all of these packages together, and you escape the poverty trap, you solve poverty, and it seems, like so, it seems so easy. Now, but of course, the, the central insight of, of economics is nothing uh, could be as easy as, as that to, and really exist. It's like the old, um, it's one of the, the, the worst and lamest jokes in economics is the, uh, the joke, and I'm telling it because it's so funny how bad the joke is. Um, <laughs> it's the economist walking along on the sidewalk and seeing a $20 bill and saying, well, I'm not going to pick that up. That couldn't be real or else somebody else would have already picked it up. <laughs> I'm glad I got the laugh for how bad the joke is. <laughs> um, so, you know, but that captures a very important insight of economics. If, if it was really that easy, why, is it ta why, is it, why are these problems still not solved after 60 years of foreign aid and development efforts? You know, why is there still so much poverty and so much of these problems still existing in the world? Uh, and that's been a lot of what the aid debate has been about. But I'm not mainly going to talk about that. <laughs> what we're mainly going to talk about is the other dimension of that solution that is, is that this solution is, and this is of course one of the reasons why it's not as easy as it seems, is this solution is specified in this purely technocratic way in which there's no politics. Ma politics magically has vanished. And so, and this, you know, this aid in itself is supposed to be completely apolitical. It doesn't have any, if there is any politics unbeknownst to the aid officials in the world, their actions have no effect on, a, on any politics whatsoever. They themselves are completely apolitical themselves. Let me give you kind of a shocking example of how much that is really not true. And this is a, a, an aid finance program in Ethiopia that was called Villagization. And what this was, it, it was one of, of unfortunately many kind of forced resettlement schemes that are now coming back in development with being implemented by official aid agencies. And so this program forced uh, poor farmers in the Gambela region of, of Ethiopia to move, they were forced by government troops at gunpoint to give up their old lands and to move to model villages like the one you see in the picture here. Uh, this model village was a new, they were forced to construct this model village uh, where the government was giving them this model village in place of their old lands that they had been uh, dispossessed of at gunpoint. The old lands, by the way, there were allegations that they were sold to foreign investors to enrich the ruling party. That sounds a little bit like politics that's going on after all. And uh, this model village is abandoned now because for one reason it had no water in the dry season. Kind of a strike against being a viable model village that people would want to live to, move to. And so, you know, the, the, the bottom line of this story is this was kind of a shocking human and political and economic rights violation of these poor peasants. And so this is a way in which aid is decidedly not apolitical. In other words, it is political. It is, it's not technocratic. It does involve some kind of, often involve some kind of political oppression, some kind of political rights violation. And that's, um, that's something that uh, the development community has been very slow to to kind of acknowledge and to kind of deal with. Uh, the kind of, these kind of rights violations that happen in the course of what is allegedly you know, politically neutral technocratic aid, it almost seems as if development people don't care about right, about political and economic and human rights, the kind that were violated in this story. 
And I could tell you many other stories with similar, some of them appeared on the, the there was one in Uganda that appeared on the front page of the New York Times, and it still didn't seem to it involved, it momentarily embarrassed the World Bank, but the World Bank got away without, with no consequences for this project. It was very quickly forgotten in the development community. And so there seems to be a kind of indifference in the development community, which to be fair to, to the aid community about this, they might just think, well, there's nothing I can do about the right situation in Ethiopia or Uganda, so I'm just not going to bother about it. I'm going to do my best feeding in these technical inputs, and there's nothing I can do about rights. Uh, the sad part of this is that, you know, rights doesn't, once, once you violate rights in one context, and this is kind of going to be the theme of the talk today, once you show kind of a, a great indifference and not caring to rights of poor people in one context, then it's going to be hard to avoid that they spill over into some other context, such as migration and xenophobia and attitudes towards poor migrants to our country here at home. And so that's the theme that we're going to explore today, is that rights really do matter because they matter not only in the aid context, but they're also going to matter in the migration context. And so that's why it's so important that we not be so, so indifferent to rights, even in the aid and development context. So the technocratic illusion is just to give you more examples. And these are anecdotal examples, but it's, it's the, the, the sort of abundance of these kind of anecdotes is so overwhelming that at some point they become data and, and are convincing that indeed there is this sort of indifference to rights. Uh, Bill Gates is one person who is kind of embodies the technocratic idea. His, and you know, again, to be fair to him, he's a very good man. He's done a lot of good. His intentions are wonderful. He just seems to have this typical blind spot that is so common in the aid community of not seeing politics, not seeing kind of the rights violations that are happening in the background. Uh, Gates is a big fan of the Ethiopian government uh, and the specific dictator, Meles Zenawi, who was in power for, for 20 years until he, he died of natural causes a couple of years ago after the time of his quotes. Uh, but Gates saw the Ethiopian government as operating not with this sort of rights violation that we just saw, but very technocratically, the government officials are seeing where things are working, using field data, where things aren't and using this beautiful technocratic approach, Melis has made real progress in helping the people of Ethiopia. And so again, we're kind of pay, you know, covering over, plastering over the rights violations, which is, and the villagization is only one in a very long string of, of sort of serial human rights violations by Melis and Awe, including the manipulation of food aid that was a scandal in 2010, two years before the villagization program, uh, Mellis was sort of like the Donald Trump of his day. He could always cover up one AIDS scandal by having another AIDS scandal come along. <laughs> um, uh, so he, he just had one human rights scandal in aid after another. The, the, the one about the manipulation of food aid in 2010, again, momentarily embarrassed the donors. And the, uh, the, the donors promised to investigate, but they never did. They told Human Rights Watch six months after the initial embarrassing report that they had dropped the investigation. This 2012 villagization uh, embarrassed DFID, the, the British aid agency, enough that they actually did drop their support for the villagization program, but they uh, continued to lavish funding on, the Ethiop on every other program of the Ethiopian government run by the same people doing this rights violation. So again, it just seems this, this serial indifference to human rights in the, in the aid world, which matters because uh, domestic and Ill if in the domestic and international politics really do matter, and part of the reason they matter is that one of the ways in which not only domestic politics matters, but international politics matters, one reason that Mellis and his supporters were able to operate with such impunity was that he was a major ally of, of the US and the UK in the war on terror. And one thing that has happened with the war on terror is that there's actually been a, an increase in aid going the most to the most oppressive and violent regimes in the world. So if you take the World Bank's ranking of sort of quality of government accountability and corruption and political violence and stability and divide the governments of the aid receiving world into the worst and the best, the worst quarter of governments have got the largest aid increase since 9-11. So if you take 9-11 as the dividing point, which you kind of expect to see the war on terror effect, uh, 
the war on terror effect has been very pronounced to kind of direct even more aid to the, the world's most oppressive and violent governments. So why does this matter? Why do we want to kind of debunk the technocratic illusion? And of course, it already matters for, for aid, uh, although, I, as I've told you, it's very hard to get aid people to care about this. It already matters in aid that we are directly violating the rights of some, some pe peasants in Ethiopia that were being deprived of their land at gunpoint. Uh, it mattered in Uganda that farmers were deprived of their land at gunpoint. This was already something that it should be defined as part of the development, development goal itself, that rights is something of intrinsic value in and of itself that should not be violated. But also it matters because we're unintentionally also by these actions participating in the whole global debate on equal rights for all people. And that's going to spill over into our attitudes towards poor people who are coming to our country in the US or the EU as migrants as well. So if we're willing to violate the rights of poor people in Ethiopia or Uganda, we're also going to be more willing to tolerate xenophobic attitudes and the kind of abuses that follow from xenophobic attitudes towards poor migrants coming to the US and the EU here. And that's the way in which you know, these very well-intentioned aid actors are unintentionally contributing to a whole global debate that is going on around, around these liberal values, equal rights for all people, that if you violate them in one context, they're gonna be, you're going to set this, the precedent for violating them in other contexts as well. And if you fight them in one context, then you are well positioned to fight them intellectually in the migration context as well. So let me give you some examples of this. And one is that, uh, that aid has always actually been used as kind of a, a politically convenient out for not wanting to deal with migration. And this has a very long history and development. Uh, I also had a lot of fun in, in writing the Tyranny of Experts book and sort of retracing the long history of the development idea. It has a very long history. It's a, it's a myth that it was only invented after World War II to deal with the aftermath of colonialism. It actually goes way back early into the 20th century, into the 19th century, way back. And part of the context is that it, it actually did, the development idea partially arose in response to dealing with migration pressures, especially from the, the, the extreme controversies that came up starting in the late 19th century and continuing in the 20th century uh, of very hostile American attitudes towards immigration from Asia. And so there was a series of laws passed in the US, and actually not only in the US, but also in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and South Africa, and many other overseas British dominions, uh, uh, excluding Asians from immigration for kind of very explicitly racist and xenophobic reasons. And you know, aid came along as kind of like, well, here's something that we can do for you instead. If you'll just please not come to our country, because we, uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, we don't actually want you to come, but if you do stay at home, we will give you aid. And so aid was a nice political out for the humanitarian lobby uh, in, the, in the rich countries in the US. It didn't, I don't think it convinced uh, people in China that they had gotten a good deal, but it did convince the humanitarian lobby in the US to kind of assuage its conscience about the kind of evils of, of kind of racist immigration restrictions. That, well, even though we were not allowing Ch the Chinese to come here, if they would just agree to stay at home, we would give them a lot of aid to develop China. And so the idea of development, one of the, the big roots of the idea of development was in pre-revolutionary China uh, in the 1920s, and started in the 1920s, and some of the early efforts in development of the Rockefeller Foundation on health and many other areas that are very familiar sounding today were in pre-revolutionary Ch China starting in the 1920s, right after the passage of what was called the Oriental Exclusion Act of 1924, which was a total ban on Asian immigration to the US. And, that it can, and aid continues to operate that way today. There's an, an author that I'm gonna kind of unfairly pick on today named Paul, Sir Paul Collier. Um, he's, a, he's a very well-meaning good guy. He's a good academic. He just happens to very well embody a lot of the things that I want to criticize, so I'm gonna engage in a very polite, uh, very polite sort of debate with Sir Paul Collier today, and he's welcome to attack back if he wants to. I'll send him a video of this, and, and you, should, you should invite him to come speak and rebut everything that I've said today. 
So Paul Collier said essentially the same thing as what as the 1920s story. He said in a book, uh, a sort of anti-migration book that he wrote in 2013 called Exodus, if a society decides not to open its doors to migrants from poor countries, it could just opt for more foreign aid. Now, I, I might be nasty and say, well, migration, we have lots of evidence that really works to get people out of poverty, and foreign aid can't really say that, but I won't go there. Uh, instead, the idea is really, if we, I'm not sure who we're convincing, but maybe we're convincing at least ourselves that we've, we're not allowing people to escape poverty by moving from a poor country to our rich country, but we are going to give them aid to alleviate their poverty if they just stay at home. And Paul Collier is still offering this deal today and saying that Norway is one example that has tight restrictions on immigration, but very generous aid. And so Norway gets a free pass on its immigration restrictions because it's giving aid. So, and then there's, there's also a way in which, so now I'm going to start talking about, there, are, there, are, there have been theories of migration and development, um, but those theories, the only sort of really popular theories about migration and development are the, are the first ones that I'm talking about on this slide, uh, which are the ones that are sort of the most hostile to migration. And I have sort of, I'm sort of going to speculate that this might not be an accident, that that there may be some way in which development for a long time has embraced the popularity of this sort of theory of the brain drain being harmful to poor countries, partly perhaps because of political reasons, because there was, it, people knew there was so much political resistance to migration in rich countries that it was convenient to have an idea of the brain drain, that the brain drain was actually bad for development. So it seemed plausible that maybe skilled migration takes away something valuable from the poor country and uh, so it's bad for development. There are some curious things about this. The, the unit of welfare analysis here is, a, is not uh, any people, it's a unit of ge geographic, a unit of geography, the territory of a nation. Is Zambia worse off because some Zambian doctors left? So the, what the word Zambia there means is the territory of Zambia, the, the GDP produced on the territory of Zambia. And why exactly is that the thing that we should be caring about? We should be caring about people. We should be caring about Zambians, regardless of whether they live at home in Zambia or whether they leave Zambia. It shouldn't matter. But somehow there's this sort of suspicious discounting that we don't count the gains to the migrants themselves. So that was part of the whole brain drain discussion from, and always has been from the very beginning that the kind of like this wasn't usually explicitly said, but the unofficial view is these sort of brain drainers are sort of like traitors to development of their own country. And uh, they, the gains to them don't really count. That they, got out, they got out of poverty themselves, but that doesn't count. Um, and you know, the, the, the sort of extreme of this was the New York Times Magazine story on the brain drain saying America is stealing the world's doctors and gave an example of a Zambian doctor. And yet, yeah, you know, what's, what's curious about this is the idea that the Zambian doctor apparently did not own themselves. You know, and they, they didn't, if, if somebody was stealing them, they were stealing from somebody. They weren't stealing them from the doctor themselves who decided voluntarily to move from Zambia to New York. So apparently they were stealing them from Zambia. So apparently the, the, the viewpoint of this story is the Zambian doctor belongs to the nation of Zambia and that's not a view of our own, our own human and political rights that any of us would accept about ourselves. Uh, I was allowed to move from my birthplace of West Virginia to uh, New York, and nobody has written a story of it. New York is stealing West Virginia's economists. <laughs> um, you know, because we don't think that way about ourselves. So why do we think that way about Zambians? So, I mean, I can give you a lot more uh, reasons why the brain drain story actually has also been mostly empirically debunked also, that actually the brain drain migrants actually do create a lot of benefits for the source country by sending back lots of remittances and lots of technological knowledge, and we could talk a lot more about that. But the main point is the, the kind of suspicious way the argument was deployed that suggests that it was accepting a political constraint on the development discussion in the first place. And so here are some other theories that are much more favorable to migration that have never been that well popularized in development but are very well accepted in the academic literature in macro. Uh, you know, in macro, we, I was just teaching this, I spent actually two whole classes on this in my PhD course in development. 
that one of the main ways development happens is by reallocating resources from high TF, from low TFP units to high TFP units. And those units, they could be geographic regions, they could be firms, they could be cities. We, we just went over a paper on the uh, US has, has realized many gains from by moving people from low TFP cities to high TFP cities like New York. But somehow we don't count those TFP gains when the gains cross the national border. And again, that sounds like there's this suspicious kind of political constraint going on in the development discussion that we're discounting those gains. And you know, also this, this, this movement from low, low productivity to high productivity places that pay higher wages, also extremely useful, extremely easy, e much easier way of relieving your own poverty by just moving. One of the migration, pro-migration researchers who's, who's made this argument is uh, Michael Clemens, who's written with Lamp Pritchett on this, and pointed out that they've done this calculation that 82% of Haitians who have ever escaped poverty out of, out of Haiti have done so by migrating from Haiti to the US. So, you know, we're overlooking a really strong poverty alleviation program by de-emphasizing migration and emphasizing aid, and that seems to be politically constrained. <coughs> uh, we could also go over, you know, lots more reasons why economists are more, re more recently recognizing a lot of the gains that are available from migration. Migrations also are, are ways that I've already mentioned, the technological diffusion that migrants send back home technology. Uh, they all, migrant diasporas are also uh, set, very good for setting up international trade networks. Uh, one of my favorite examples, so there's some very well-known examples of this, the Chinese in Southeast Asia were a huge part of the Southeast Asian boom that the overseas Chinese formed networks of, of international trade that, that helped Southeast Asia create lots of development booms that were usually attributing to national development policies, but are really a lot to do with migration and diasporas. Uh, Lebanese and Indians in Africa are sort of famous for the same thing. And then there's a very unfamous example of Maurits. Who are Maurits? So how, how many of you have seen a site like this in New York City? Right, some guy looked on like this, selling stuff like this on the street corner. So I'm going to tell you a trick by which you can uh, amaze people. You know, you, you'll be walking along with somebody on the si sidewalk in New York with a friend of yours that you want to impress. And you go up to this guy and you say, are you Maurice? And he will look very surprised and he'll say yes. And then your friend will be really impressed at your sophisticated knowledge of ethnic networks in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason it's so easy is because Maurice have completely taken over the, the street tra trade network of New York. All of these guys, literally all of these guys in New York are Maurice. So who are Maurice? Marids are a religious brotherhood that originated in the late 19th century in Senegal, in the city of Touba, Senegal, from a, a Marid prophet known as uh, Bamba. And they became one of these diasporas that just had a very strong work ethic and travel ethic that they were in a good position to set up this amazing kind of international <coughs> trading network that migrating out of Senegal into New York and Milan and Paris, they've totally taken over retail trade networks and generated lots of prosperity both for Senegal back home and for the communities like Little Senegal and Harlem, which is a relatively prosperous community and that actually even created some millionaires in Little Senegal and in Harlem in New York City. That's a, an example of migrants just creating lots of value and development by migrating. So, you know, you, by the way, you, you could say at any point during this talk that I'm have my own political agenda too far in the other direction, that I'm too enthusiastically pro-migration and I'm telling you all the positive stories while I'm accusing the other development people of suppressing all the negative stories. So probably that's true and probably the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle, so allow for that as I go along. So, and of course the, the last thing that migration allows you to do is to escape those failed aid and 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 also those, the other popular kind of aid that has happened in the, the war on terror period of the fixing failed states peacekeeping type of aid. Uh, the Ethiopia villagization actually itself, the, the story that I told you earlier in the talk, itself created uh, its own refugee diaspora and it created refugees that went over the border into Kenya into refugee camps fleeing the villagization program in Ethiopia and the reason that DFID actually did eventually get embarrassed into dropping their support for the program is one of them actually made, it, made their way to, 
a, a guy who is known in court documents only as Mr. O, made his way to the UK and sued Diffin for what had happened to him. <laughs> he sued the British aid agency for what had happened to him. I'm real, that was a you know, really great occasion on which someone was momentarily held responsible for all of this that we're talking about today. Uh, Diff had actually decided to kind of quiet the whole thing before it went to court. They agreed to s drop their support for villagization before it went to court. And so it, it, it never actually went to trial. Uh, other top sources for refugees are, you know, other fleeing from other failed peacekeeping or military interventions such as Iraq, Somalia, DR, Congo. And that's, you know, that's part of the sad story of, of the failure of aid and peacekeeping and, and fixing failed state <coughs> efforts. So, you know, the least thing we could do is let the victims of those efforts migrate to avoid the consequences of what happened in those cases. So that's an, yet another argument for the migration as a safety valve for failed aid efforts. Now, the, the last part of the talk today, I'm going to talk about something that's more speculative and, and frankly, is just the beginning of a research agenda rather than really based on any, uh, any solid research agenda. It's something that economists are beginning to talk about what political, po political scientists and sociologists have already been talking about for a long time. Uh, economists are very arrogant sort of imperialists of the social scientists. We only think something is a real topic once we start talking about it. So. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I apologize for myself and my fellow economists. But. So um, Ed Glazer wrote a kind of path-breaking article called The Political Economy of Hatred, how uh, politicians manipulate racial animosity and xenophobia. Uh, there's been there's a couple of papers by economists on how the US government manipulates human rights reporting on its allies. And then a most recent paper on stereotypes that I'm going to talk about a little bit in a moment. And then there's a Journal of Economic Perspective Symposium on something that's going to be related to what we're talking about here on how uh, our beliefs about development and our theories about development themselves, we may, uh, this article described it as motivated evasion, that we think about evidence in a way that uh, might take our self-interest into account, that we might want to find a, find a nice development theory to talk about that makes us feel good what, even while we're acting e egotistically. And I've already given you a kind of example of that, uh, brain drain. So uh, brain drain was a classic example of that. Now, of course, brain drain as a theory, as a theory should be tasted, tested only on the basis of objective logic and theory and evidence. I'm not saying any of this political influence stuff automatically makes a theory wrong. I'm just suggesting that sometimes these theories are also embraced, not because they're correct, but because they're convenient. And the idea of sort of motivated Bayesians is that we want to embrace theories that are politically convenient for our view of ourselves. So the idea of feeling moral while acting egotistically is, is uh, the brain drain theory is a good example of that. So it allowed the, the, sort of the rich country voters to feel like uh, we don't want you to come to our country for our own selfish reasons, uh, but we don't want to feel selfish. So we actually want to convince you that skilled migration is bad for you. That is, we're actually acting in your own good by not letting you come to our country. So if you, can, if you get a theory that has those ingredients, it's going to, it's going to sell well uh, politically. And that's sort of a prediction of these kind of new theories of kind of motivated Bayesian. Now, these theories can be very, very dangerous <laughs> because the, you know, they could just discredit all objective knowledge altogether, which is the extreme that some people have gone to, the kind of Foucault, postmodernist view of knowledge, that there's no objective knowledge, that all, all knowledge is political, and I, I'm not, I don't want to go there at all. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting anything like that. I'm just suggesting that we take into, that we be aware of the kind of political constraints and motivations that might influence development ideas and theories, but not automatically discredit them. We still have to test the theories on the basis of evidence and logic and theory. So, you know, the political economy of hatred, we could also kind of talk about the political economy of compassion. That the, in, in development, we've had an interest in creating certain kinds of images that are good for motivating a lot of fundraising for development, a lot of contributions to NGOs, a lot of taxpayer support for aid dollars. And oftentimes, these images are kind of stereotypical negative images of poor people. And so that's the, that's the last part that I'm going to talk about today, about how we sort of unintentionally maybe ourselves create 
contributed in our own little small way to xenophobic images, that we ourselves have created stereotypical negative images. And you know, the, in defense of that, you know, negative images are great for fundraising. Negative images of poor people are great for fundraising, and that's maybe the higher calling that people see in creating those images. Uh, and by the way, and by the way, you should also be aware of the incentive of the other side, that the incentives for migration might have an incentive to exaggerate the positive images like I might have been doing in this talk, because I've already warned you. Uh, that you know, I might have an image to tell you these happy stories of Maurids and uh, you know skilled workers who who benefit everybody and all that you know, because I am supporting I, I'm more inclined to support my pro migration arguments. So both sides, you know, need the, the the aim of this exercise is just to be aware of how these images can be manipulated to support either side. And if you're aware of the manipulation, then you're more likely to go look for that solid evidence and try to make sure whether the evidence is, is supporting them or not. So there's been lots of discussions about this in development debates for a long time. It was really started by, um, well, before I get there, I'll give you kind of, before I get you the, the origins of this sort of debate about uh, development images in, in development debates, I'll give you, again, I'll pick on poor Mr. Collier. Uh, here is a previous statement from his, so he, the reason he's such a great example is he, he first wrote a book about promoting aid and development called The Bottom Billion, very successful and in, in, book that had a lot of impact. And in this book, he gives this image that Africa coexists with the 21st century, but their reality is the 14th century, civil war, plague, ignorance. Now that's, uh, I, I have to confess, I didn't, was not a fan of this statement. Uh, I have spent a lot of time in Africa. I have, I, why am I not a fan of this statement? Well, this is, it seems like an example of what, exactly what uh, this paper that I talked about by Bordelo, Kaufman, Jenny Ole, and Schleifer on stereotypes, we're talking about that there's a, it's true that there's a higher incidence of war, disease, and illiteracy in Africa than in some other regions. What's going on here is, is what, what, what is going on here that creates the stereotype? So there's a, it's true that there's a higher incidence of these, these problems in Africa. So how do we go to this generalization that is in Collier's statement? Well, it's, here's the theory of stereotypes that's presented by these authors, that there's some, there's some behavior that is overrepresented in Africa compared to some comparison region. So I, here I picked on the example of uh, one aspect of war that was in the, the the Collier statements, child soldiers. So you think of child soldiers, a lot of you will think of African stories because there are a lot of African stories of child soldiers. You could even make the, the and it's definitely, you could show that compared to some, a lot of other comparison groups, the incidence of child soldiers in Africa is higher than in other regions. So how does that create a stereotype? Well. You could even say that most child soldiers are African. Most child soldiers in the world are African. That statement could possibly be true, and it's not automatically xenophobic or racist to say that. That's just a descriptive statement. The misleading part of the stereotype comes when people assume the reverse probability that most Africans are child soldiers, which is obviously ridiculous. That's obviously not true. But that's, that, that confusion of reverse conditional probabilities is the confusion that Schleifer et al zero in on is how stereotypes get created. That some group is overrepresented in some behavior, and then we start assuming that the, that, that behavior represents all members of that group. All Africans are child soldiers, all Africans are violent. And so then we conclude that Africa is in the, in the 14th century with the plague, war, and violence. So, you know, the mathematical way to say this is probability of A conditional on B is not equal to probability of B conditional on A. So please write that down and remember that <laughs> for processing all, all stereotypes in the future. Um, now, in defense of the stereotype, you know, the image of child soldiers as perpetrated in many popular books and movies and, and has been enormously helpful to raise money for post-conflict reconstruction in, in places with a lot of suffering, like Sierra Leone and Liberia, where there were bad civil wars and child soldiers. So you could say, maybe it's OK that there are these negative stereotypes, because it's so, so useful to raise lots of money for 
the good cause of helping people who are in really bad shape because of the aftermath or, or, the, or maybe it's not even the aftermath yet of a really bad civil war. And of course, child soldiers, are, you can't think of a group of people who are more horribly treated and mistreated than, than child soldiers that anyone, all of us, of course, would like to help that group. Uh, but of course, if, if it leads to a statement like Collier's that we think of this as typical of Africa, that the typical African is like a child soldier, then that's, that's not so good. That creates a stereotype of African that is profoundly disrespectful of the dignity and rights of Africans not to be mistreated. The statement, in fact, is intrinsically xenophobic because what is the definition of xenophobia? Xenophobia is an unreasonable fear of foreigners. So if you... If you think on the basis of this mistaken stereotypical reasoning that Schleicher and all have established is very common, and by the way, this has been shown by psychologists like Kahneman and, and, and Tversky in their work that these, these, this kind of reasoning is very, very common, a very, very common cognitive bias, um, then that, that is, image is already wrong in and of itself, that it's disrespectful to the rights of Africans to think of Africans in such a, ne a negative way. And then, of course, it's going to blow up when you start, we start talking about migration of Africans to the US or to the EU, that if you have such a negative image, it's going to fuel even, even make more toxic the immigration debate. So here's the real data. So I said, you know, eventually you have to get to the real data, the real evidence. So this is something that I've been working on for a long time. This was actually a paper published a long time ago in 2009 in the Journal of Economic Literature trying to correct some of these stereotypes. So what is the average annual war deaths in Africa as a proportion of the population? 0 0.001 is the proportion of the African population dying in war. What is the proportion of male children ages 10 to 17 who actually were child soldiers in 1999? It's 0 0.0019, 0.19% of all African ages, male Africans aged 10 to 17 were child soldiers. And that actually is, was a historic high. It's much lower now that the, the civil wars have ended. Uh, famine, is famine a typical experience of Africans? 0. 0.0029 proportion of the African population. Our, as I read a story recently in the New York Times, Africa is emptying out all of Africa's refugees. You know, an image that creates very fearful images for rich country voters that all of Africa is on the move trying to migrate into Europe or the US. Is that true? What is the percent of refugees? Uh, 0.0053 of the population. Uh, and AIDS was another stereotype that was at the time that I was debunking. So you know, when you look at the, at the true proportions, uh, of course these things are extremely, extremely low proportions. So this statement that you know, the reality is the 14th century civil war plague ignorance, that's just a grossly unfair generalization about Africans when you look at the real data. Uh, I could go over more of them like this. Jamaican murder rates are 50 times higher than in Britain, so wor be worried about those Jamaican immigrants with guns. Jamaican murder rate is, is a lot higher than Britain because Britain has almost no murder rate, but um, there's something about the Brits, they're just, you know, can't even get around to murdering anybody, but... Um, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> but what is the actual murder rate in Jamaica? It's 0. .00045 of the population. You know, that is, this is a very small, small, small proportion of Jamaicans and of, of Jamaican immigrants. So this confusion about, uh, you know, once you hear about some overrepresented group, you, you apply it to, as Collier did, to all Jamaican immigrants, and it's only applying to this extremely small proportion. It's, that's how stereotypes get created by this simple cognitive mistake that is so common in all of us. Uh, another one by Collier is Nigerian immigrants to other societies tend to be untrusting and opportunistic. Sorry I'm quoting these things. It's horrible to even say these words off the page. Uh, you know, so again, you can say that the incidence of trust is empirically lower in Nigeria than some other places, but it actually wasn't that low. It's, the reality is almost nobody around the world trusts anyone else. <laughs> uh, Nigerians were actually only 20% trusting, but that's only a little bit below the world median for all countries. And actually, Nigerians were more trusting than France. Collier should have been worried about the French, not the, <laughs> not the Nigerians. 
And also, these surveys are, say nothing about opportunism. They're about tr do you trust other people. So the, the statement about being opportunistic was completely gratuitous. And by the way, um, the British are less trusting than the US, so we should definitely exclude those distrustful Brits, <laughs> if we're going to follow that logic. Sorry, that was nasty. That was uncalled for. I, I, I retract that statement. So you know, in development, we've been worried about these stereotype problems for a very long time. Um, and actually, other people have been worried about them for a much longer time than I have, uh, or than other, other pe most people in development like me have. Uh, one of the pioneers in this is a guy who's still very active today in development, Alex DeWall, who I really recommend to you on all subjects, almost all subjects. I'm gonna, he wrote a wonderful book called Famine Crimes way back in uh, 97, in which he condemned disaster pornography as it was used way back then, and it's really continued ever since to kind of characterize reporting on, on really extreme situations. Uh, you know, in the, in the development debate, it's kind of evolved on the whole idea of poverty porn, that you sort of exaggerate how much poverty there actually is in this sort of stereotypical way that I've already covered. And then that is very good for motivating donations to NGOs and to supporting taxpayer dollars for aid, but it's not so good for xenophobia. So his examples were pretty shocking uh, in the original. I'm giving you the old examples just to show you how long this issue has been around, and yet we still have not, we still have not really dealt with it enough. Uh, it's been around for over 20 years, and we still have yet to deal with it enough in development. Uh, DeWall's example was such examples like uh, a television producer and Somali doctor saying, show me the children who are most so severely malnourished to be photographed. Those are the ones I want to put in the photos that I'm sending back to the US mm. and the EU. A British photographer was, found, was caught actually staging photographs of gunmen on jeeps that were very scary looking to send back to the, the readers in the US and the UK. And these images actually matter. They help trigger repeated US interventions in Somalia that uh, we all know did not end well. And that's been kind of the pattern ever since. That, and here's, here's kind of another very old example, but the way it's kind of hung around in, uh, and this, this is uh, fun to talk about because it involves some really dumb celebrities <laughs> behaving dumbly. Um, uh, this, is, this is another example showing how long poverty porn has been around and, and how persistent it is. Because this was a, a song called Do They Know It's Christmas? <laughs> It was first recorded in 1984 at the time of the Ethiopia famine in 1984. Another example of the very apolitical cluelessness about politics is that the Ethiopia famine was not caused by the tyrannical government that actually caused it, but by some kind of natural factors. Um, and then this song has been re-released ever since, 1989, 2004, and it was re-released in 2014 for the 30th anniversary that they thought somehow worth commemorating. <laughs> uh, and the reason they re-released it in 2014 is because they were trying to raise money for Ebola. They created a new stereotype that all of Africa had Ebola. Um, this is actually the second best-selling song in UK history, this song, Do They Know It's Christmas? Uh, if you, you probably are curious what the first best is, uh, I, I was just, I'm a data nerd, so I haven't looked it up. It's the Diana song, Lady Diana song that was sung at her funeral by Elton John, so there you go. Uh, so almost caught up with Princess Diana, this song. Okay, so here's the cover of the original 1984 uh, album, <laughs> Christmas. So to show you how, how wide, how, massively produced this. I said it was best selling. I actually found this. I, I'm from, I, I was born in West Virginia, but I grew up in a very small town in Ohio. I found this in my hometown record store in, a, in this very small town in Ohio. And I immediately bought it because I was like, wow, this is great. This is a classic of poverty porn. <laughs> and so there's these happy children celebrating Christmas in the background, and then there's this awful image of, if you look closely, of emaciated children tormented by flies in the foreground. And that was the image they wanted to communicate of Africa, where the lyrics said, nothing ever grows, no rain or rivers flow. Um, they could have checked, there are actually rain, there is actually rain and rivers in Africa. Um, uh, and then the clip, the, the closing climax of the song is, do they know it's Christmas at all? 
They also didn't check that Ethiopian, uh, the majority of Ethiopians are Orthodox Christians. They actually do know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a major development problem. Oh, people don't know when Christmas is. <laughs> um, so this song it just kept getting repeated. It was repeated at the Live 8 concert in 2005, which again had a figure of an emaciated child. This kind of breaks my heart in, you know, in two ways. I mean, it breaks my heart that there really still are emaciated children, but also that all of Africa is portrayed as typified by an emaciated child. So you know, it's, it cuts, it, it's a tough image in two ways. And, uh, and Bono said that the, according, the, according to the 2014 song lyrics, there's a world outside your window. I'm not going to sing this for you. That would be really simple. Uh, <laughs> it's a world of dread and, dread and fear, a song of hope where there's no hope tonight. And you know, so this image of Africa, a world of dread and fear, no hope. And last of all, Bono, still, has still 30 years later, has still not figured out that they know it's Christmas. <laughs> So, you know, here's some more positive images. Uh, child mortality is a tragic problem, but it actually has been moving in the right direction. And, you know, this, uh, all of these child mortality graphs have been one of the great success stories, and we could give aid some credit for that, and maybe some of the funds raised by negative stereotyping helped solve this problem, but we should also have been creating this more positive image that there has been a lot of progress by aid, but also by mothers and fathers taking care of their own children or you know, finding ways to keep their children alive. We should give them some credit too and not portray them as all you know, carelessly letting their children die by creating these stereotypes. Uh, war and violence. This is a great graph from Steven Pinker about the evolution of war and violence, deaths from war and violence in the, in the 20th century into the 2000s. So you know, war, deaths from war and violence are at a historic low today. And that's another thing that you would not realize by today's scary xenophobic rhetoric about the you know, epidemic of violence around the world is violence is actually at an extreme low by historic standards. And you know, as far as those 14th century conditions in Africa, I'm pretty sure they did not have cell phones in the 14th century. Uh, a remarkable thing about African success has been the explosion of cell phones in Africa, which now has more than twice the number of cell phone subscribers as the US does. And these are not just you know, cell people, boyfriends and girlfriends talking on cell phones. These are farmers finding out how they can do advantageous deals in other cities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and Africa is, not, is no longer all about aid. It's a lot more about the remittances that are sent back by the migrants that I was mentioning. That's one of the arguments against the, the old negative view of migrants. The positive view of migrants is they send lots and lots of remittances back to the source countries. And also, because of the positive things going on in Africa, Africa is attracting lots of foreign direct investment. <coughs> Africa is look, looking like a better place for investment now than, well, the U.S. since the last uh, couple of presidential debates. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing I'll leave you, leave you with is the, here, here's again, a, and again, maybe I'm uh, going too far in the other direction looking for positive images, but here's a, an amazing statistic that has been circulated a lot that Africans are also a remarkably educated group in the US. So all those uh, Nigerian doctors that were accused of being untrusting and opportunistic are actually doing accounting for a lot of great stuff in the US and UK. In the US, 49% of African immigrants are college educated. That's more than any other ethnic group, either native or immigrant. So, you know, uh, one thing I like about this is, you know, one, one group of groups reacted very forcefully against poverty foreign about Africa has been Africans. So there is, the best example of this I know is a satirical video that was produced by some, some African musicians about Africa, a radiator aid from Africa to Norway. And, you know, there are, there's, you know, this song, kind of emotional song about it. Norway kids are freezing, Africans can help. We send radiator aid to Norway. You know, create a stereotype of Norway as all freezing children. Uh, we can help them with radiators. And uh, now it's Africa for Norway. Uh, you know, so I, the African musicians had a wonderful sense of humor about uh, rebutting all this poverty porn and negative stereotypes that were directed their way. So let's sum up now and then you know, get ready for some nice Q&A. Uh, I think the problem is that 
you know, there's, there's been this sort of unacknowledged political constraint that migration debates have put on development that have distorted development debates, distorted <coughs> development images. So development advocacy has tended to ne neglect the political and human rights of poor people. That has tended to spill over across from development into debates about xenophobia and migration, that if we're going to mistreat Ethiopians and villagization programs at home, that we're, we're, more misprone, we're more prone to mistreat immigrants that are already in our country from Ethiopia or from other poor countries, and, or Muslims in our country from other poor countries. I purposely stayed away from the whole like, toxic issue of Muslim stereotypes. You could see how easily we could go there about how you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the presumption, which could be right, that a lot of terrorists or most terrorists are Muslim, obviously does not translate into assuming that most Muslims are terrorists. And that's the stereotype that's been so toxic in our own discourse. Uh, development has been guilty of, of, of itself creating some of these xenophobic stereotypes, which tend to fuel negative images of poor people. And that has been done for very good-hearted reasons. I want to try to, again, keep recognizing that this has been done for very good humanitarian reasons, but it's not a good, uh, there are other ways to achieve the same humanitarian goals without engaging in kind of negative xenophobic stereotypes. So, you know, what happens in development doesn't stay in development. It tends to spill over into migration. And so if we care about equal rights, then we have to assert them in all fields, in development and in migration, that all people around the world, black and white, Christian and Muslim, rich and poor, are indeed the good people. Thank you very much. So I'd be happy to uh, take questions. Yes, there's one here. Hi. Please, please speak loudly because uh, I want everyone to hear you. Just please. Hi. Oh, this, this was an amazing lecture. It's really, really informative. But then um, I have a question about... Sorry, I didn't hear the first part you said. <laughs> <laughs> Courses this semester, and every class makes me read you. So, <laughs> all right, you're going too far there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, you said something about brain drain that I wanted yeah. to ask about. Um, yeah. So you talked about how, and I agree with you that the that Zambia doesn't own the Zambian doctor. Right. Um, the right. Zambian doctor has the right to make his own decisions and stuff. But don't you think that for every Zambian doctor that leaves? you're affecting the number of people who receive help from these doctors because if the doctor yeah. comes work and works here and gets money and sends the money back to Zambia, it doesn't translate into more doctors in Zambia helping um, the sick people there. Yeah, so a couple of things about that. Uh, so of course that matters a lot. So of course it's, and it's still important to solve the problem of Zambians having access to doctors. So, um, so you know, one, one thing to ask is, what is going on in Zambia that uh, leads to a very high exodus of doctors for, for the UK or the US? Of course, some of it is obvious that, you know, we talked about the TFP theory, the higher productivity in the US and UK means that they can pay more for doctors than Zambia can. So Zambian, the doctors are going to go to where there are higher wages. But we also want to know is, you know, even taking that into account, is there something, is the Zambian Health Service really doing badly paying, paying its own doctors? Is there something about the way aid programs are designed that are not well, they're not addressing well the problem of getting adequate payments for doctors or getting adequate supply of doctors? So those are all things to take account. As far as, but to even get more nuance on the brain drain issue, the reason it's kind of gotten overturned is remember some of the people in Zambia who are who are going to all the time and effort to become doctors, they know that these migration opportunities that exist are out there. And so, you know, it would, you should not automatically assume if you just shut off the migration that you would now get all this wonderful supply of doctors in Zambia, because if you shut off the migration opportunities, then fewer people would want to get trained as doctors in Zambia in the first place. Because some of them were already responding to the expectation that some of them would be able to migrate. 
So that's the other nuance of the brain drain issue. Why it's, and you know, somehow all of these arguments were just left out there undiscovered. Uh, my great uh, colleague, who's a Ghanaian American economist, Yao and Yarko, uh, is one of those who has really uncovered a lot of these arguments and argued them very forcefully. He himself is a great example of the African diaspora doing great things for Ghana. He, uh, he embodies this kind of reversal of the brain drain. He's, he's also uncovered a lot of these intellectual arguments. It just seems kind of strange that these arguments were kind of laying around in plain sight and not talked about for so many years. Why was that? It, and I, you know, I can't prove that it was because of anti-migration sentiment, but that's that's what it was. It seems suspicious that all sides of that argument. Okay, more. Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm James Lady Williams. I'm from Nigeria. I trust everyone in this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is the ideal role for foreign aid in, when we talk about development, especially in Africa? Um, yeah, I knew I was going to get that question. <laughs> um, you know, I think um, I think there are good answers to that question, and I think you know, we can talk about things about making. You know, one of the problems with foreign aid is that it's it's not only not accountable for rights violations, it's not accountable for kind of poor delivery of what it's supposed to be doing in the first place, which is just. You know, it's been relatively more successful in health areas, which seem to be more more amenable to aid solutions than most other areas, so that's an area where aid has worked better. Uh, but partially because aid health outcomes are more observable and accountability is easier in health than other areas, so accountability is the biggest problem in aid. It's a lack of accountability for kind of material delivery. So that's, that's where I think aid could still have a role if we could fix that problem in health kind of just as simple. Yeah? I want to ask about the sort of um, you know, you are pushing back against a great amount of negative in, uh, negative imagery that you say is very much uh, purposeful um, in the aid debate. Uh, would you agree that there is an equal amount of purposeful negative imagery in the migration debate, especially in, in Europe in the last couple of years? Oh, um, sure, sure, yeah. You know, picture, pictures of uh, Syrian boys on beaches and African migrants uh, dead in boats in the Mediterranean. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I wasn't even going there because I, you know, that's not my area. I don't. I, I know what development economists and development workers and professionals are saying. I don't know what as much about that area as you're talking about. But of course, the whole area that the whole idea that both sides of the migration debate will have an incentive to want to manipulate images and stereotypes for, um, uh, you know, for uh, their own political reasons. Now again. <coughs> Let's, I want to be as you know scrupulously fair as I can be. You know, th this is another example of kind of mixing up conditional probabilities. Uh, uh, the assumption that you should automatically discredit an argument because it was political, which is actually not true. So you could say that most. Uh, you could say something like you know most people who are against, but most xenophobes are against migration. You could say you could make a statement like that, right? But it's not true that most people against migration are xenophobes. So it's, it's also true that someone like me can take advantage of those, uh, you know, those, those kind of cognitive biases that we make for stereotypes and create a stereotype of xenophobes or of anti-migration people, right? So that, you know, both sides can play this game. And the important thing is that we just be aware of this game and then we then check these stereotypes against the actual evidence. That's the important thing. Yes? Um, so you mentioned the, the trope of uh, Africa as like an emaciated child, basically, um, with that ad for that music festival. Um, do you think that some aspects of poverty porn are still fueled by the lumping of sub-Saharan Africa into one entity versus 40-something different countries? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, I mean, of course, the, the whole idea of stereotypes is that you kind of generalize about a whole group as if they were all alike, which is in itself intrinsically insulting. You know, stereotypes and generalizations are intrinsically you know, xenophobic and insulting in and of themselves, even if they, even if they didn't affect anything else. Uh, they would still be intrinsically you know, bad in and of themselves because of this sort of gross generalization. Um, so, you know, the, the, what a stereotype, these kind of stereotypes tend to do is that it's, it, it's almost as if they're assuming there's zero variation within the group they're talking about. If you find one emaciated child, 
stereotypical thinking of this sort of gross generalization about extrapolating from a few images and negative, negative data that you see to apply to a much larger group and assume that they're all the same, which is intrinsically insulting. <coughs> yes? Um, I'm going to say full disclosure, I'm an aid worker, so I have a lot of biases, but I do care about the issues that you suggested that the yeah. audience may or may not care as much about. Yeah. Um, I, when you talk about xenophobia, I wanted to know if you found any sort of um, additional detail about whether or not it was racialized in the sense that, especially in the migrant discussion, speaking about people or communities that are not of color, um, it's usually determined that they're migrants or settlers versus communities of Oh yeah, and that race is a is a huge part of what we're talking about. I mean, it's, um, you know, so xenophobia and racism are kind of cousins of each other that are kind of feeding off of each other. That so, you know, a negative stereotype is much more likely to kind of gain gain traction uh, if it's if it's with a, a group that seems you know very racially distinct from from the host country majority that doesn't. Some animosity towards towards some other race. You know, so even domestically, you get into like right. the Trump example of African Americans right. in inner cities and right. kind of right. this narrative right. of like this war zone and the 14th century kind of right. Uh, right. 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 Yeah. So very much. I mean, if you think back to the violence graph, obviously the big peak in the Stephen Pinker <laughs> violence graph was World War II. So you know that we could have easily invented a stereotype that the the most violent people in recent sort of last century were Germans. You know, there actually was kind of a stereotype for a while that Germans, all Germans were Nazis, and, uh, and during the, during the war there was definitely some of that stereotype, but it didn't stick. You know, we don't think that way today, and, it didn't think it, and that way of thinking disappeared pretty quickly. Why is that? It's because you know, Germans are European, and they're white. There's, you know, it's obviously different. So that, there's a lot to that. Yes. So your um, statistic on the gun violence in the UK and Jamaica, how does that yeah. compare to US gun violence? Because I would think that trends in Jamaica is just as dangerous as Kingston. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so, um, so again, you know, uh, the important thing is, the, the thing that we're really focusing on here is even when you do find a very high rate of gun violence, which you would, Aren't as you said, higher? yeah, which yeah. of course you would find in, in <coughs> as that. high as Jamaica. But the important thing, and of course, the state, pointing those things out is not automatically like xenophobic or racist no. to point those out. Right. Right. That, those, are, those are evidence. But then how do we process that evidence? Does that then get generalized to apply to the whole, to some whole group that the, the, the murderers belong to? You know, which is, you it's know, geographic. It's, yeah, it's just a geographic thing. It's like, you know, if I'm in a, in a bar with three other people and a terrorist walks in, you know, I'm suddenly become part of a group that has a higher incidence of terrorism. Am I, am I really more likely to become a terrorist? No, it's just <laughs> accidental group association. You know, that's that's how more logically we are should be thinking about these kind of statistics that, and the cognitive mistake that just because a mem one member of some group belongs to uh, commits some very horrible deeds that doesn't generalize to some larger group. And here in the United States, you're still allowed to get a, an assault rifle even if you're on a no-fly list. Well, I can't. I can't. That's true. I'm sorry. That's true. Okay. I'll start. Well, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yes. I'm curious.
PFP story about migration, mm -hmm. that migrants just are pulled into countries that have higher productivity. Higher productivity means that all factors of production get paid more. So the capital gets paid more, skilled workers get paid more, unskilled workers get paid more. So you know the story of migration, and that's also a part of the, it's an interesting part of the theory of the economic effects of migration here in the U.S. Because if that's what's driving migration, it also doesn't hurt U.S. workers because it, it's pulling in the capital and the skilled workers and the unskilled workers all at the same time. It's not driving down the wages of any of or returns to any of those groups in the U.S. And so, you know, if that's the right theory, then uh, all groups from any strata of society in the, in the source country will benefit from migration. Because they're, what they're doing by migrating is they're, it's like they're, you know, the explanation for, there could be lots of explanations for TFP. It could be misallocation stories, institutional stories. They're taking advantage of whatever social and political and institutional factors make possible a higher level of productivity in a rich country by moving from a country with a lower level of productivity. And that's something that's going to benefit anyone. Yes? Uh, so you kind of mentioned, you mentioned, you talked about the brain drain theory, about the overemphasis on using uh, geographical units as the unit yeah, of welfare. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to ask more about um, what you see as the nuances that need to be taken into account, especially when talking about nation states as units. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned that, because I think that's, um, that's been a, a really big bias in, in economics, in development economics. You know, that we're always talking about the development economics of nations, by which we mean the geographic units. It's partly, uh, you know, that's out of just that's where the data is available from. So I'm guilty of writing tons of papers about cross-country based national data because that's where the data is available. Uh, it's only more recently we've started to get other, we're starting to get like satellite lights data that gives us some proxy for poverty and prosperity in, in, in geographic regions all over the world. That we can start talking about ethnic groups and geographic regions having distinct. But I think it's not only because of the data availability. I think there is a political bias also that we really, you know, we think of ourselves as development experts as we're advising national policymakers. You know, there's no, and national policymakers are concerned with their own, the territory of their own country. So, you know, in a rich country or a poor country, they're concerned with the territory of their own country. There's no sort of international policymaker that's in charge of all the migrating people that are migrating to get their own TFP gains by migrating. Now, nobody's, there's nobody in charge of that that we could be advising, and so we wind up orienting our, we wind up orienting, basically orienting development economics to serve the agenda of political officials, which I think we're going too far by doing that. That's, we should not limit ourselves to just be the slaves of political officials by, by doing development economics. We should do what's good for all people that could be affected by development, which includes migrants who are not covered by any political official. Do you see change happening? It's, it's already happened in the academic development economics. We've already written you know, lots of papers about this that, that I'm drawing on to, to give this talk. It's not yet really happening in the, the official development world or the NGO world, which is still very much having the mindset of helping nations rather than people. Yeah, I've got lots of, yes. Yeah, please. So uh, this is a comment on uh, the section that you were talking about, development theories and like nations are dangerous things. I was just wondering that uh, the way we explain domestic migration, rural to urban, and urban economics has a you know uh, you know framework for that for zoning and building regulations restrict oh, yeah. and protect yeah. rents actually. Yeah. So the same yeah. phenomenon yeah. I think at yeah. the international yeah. migration is at one point of time they will move to these countries and now they don't want others to move to these countries. The way that it happened in cities actually that some yeah. some yeah. time ago they moved it. So I think that that provides a nice framework to explain international migration. That what is what has evolved in urban economics on that uh, yeah. events thing. That yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. That is because uh, um, uh, by coincidence, I was just covering that in the development PhD class that I'm teaching at NYU. There's a paper by Shea and, and Moretti just recently about. Glazer has also done. Yeah, research. yeah. So um, so you know it, it is interesting that so. The Shea Moretti paper talks about um, basically that Silicon Valley and New York City and San Francisco have these sort of housing regulations that prevent uh, enough, you know, there could be lots of easy productivity gains from letting more people come in to, 
to those very high productivity places, but they're not coming in because of the housing regulations. That don't, there's no housing for people to come into. And, uh, but what was most interesting to me about that story is we're, we talk about that, and, oh yeah, it's a good thing if we just destroy those barriers, let more people in, that's a great thing. Why don't we think the same way about international migration? You know, it's exactly the same story. There's a high TFP area that will benefit everyone who moves to it, get them out of poverty, they will be able to share the TFP gains with people back in the source country. Why don't we think that way about TFP gains internationally? The one that we automatically assume are un, you know, unmitigated good when we talk about them domestically. So, I don't know. <laughs> yes? Um, how do you think we can raise awareness about poverty or about human rights violations in other countries without creating stereotypes? Um, you know, I think I think a more balanced story is, uh, first of all, I, to, to be fair, I think the awareness of poverty porn and stereotypes has already, has already spread uh, quite a bit in development. And you know, there's, there's some variation, but it's kind of like the bad NGOs and the good NGOs. <laughs> the good NGOs are already kind of doing a much better job, um, you know, pre presenting a more balanced image, which you know, may or may not hurt their fundraising, but um, I think they, they they have a better conscience about what they're doing. If they are raising fun, funds under a more accurate, balanced portrayal of what's going on with poor people, so I hope that I hope that will spread even more. I haven't been looking much over here, so let me get anybody over here. Yes. There. Um, thank you for your presentation. No, um, thank you for coming. Uh, what would you say uh, is the role of um, remittances within your theories of migration and aid? What role? Yeah, well, remittances is something that uh, you know lots of uh, migrants do voluntarily. They want, they have relatives and family back home. They want to send, they want to share the gains that they get with their family. Uh, the fam it, the migration could even be a family decision. You know, the families uh, they are optimizing within the family. We do, we have this, you know, one child or relative that we can send to New York to earn a lot of money and share with the rest of us. And the others in the family will do things here back in the source country. And you know, the migration can be part, and it could be part even of a broader ethnic or kin network, that, uh, like the Maurice, where the you know some some people are sent abroad to, to benefit the whole ethnic or kin network that works as an international unit. And remittances are just one link in the chain in that. And that's a much more positive view of how migration is, you know, is benefiting both the source and the destination country. If, if, if it's representing a whole family or kin or ethnic network. Yeah. So Americans in general have a pretty negative view of foreign aid. They think we give a lot Maybe more. Maybe that's a stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but there are some measures where they think <coughs> we spend a lot more in yeah, foreign that's aid true. than we yeah. do. Yeah, that's true. When they ask yeah. people like, yeah. What programs they want to cut, foreign aid is near the top, and generally the sentiment seems to be yeah, yeah. we have enough problems back here that we should be spending money on. So like in that political environment, is allowing more immigration a realistic alternative? And if it's not, is foreign aid still better than nothing? Uh, well, that's a complex question. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I mean, I always make the argument aid is often offered as a substitute for migration. Uh, we don't want to let you migrate, but if you stay at home, we'll give you aid, which is not a very, not a very adequate compensation for, you know, what would have happened if we let you migrate. Um, so you're making sort of the argument in reverse. If we're already hostile to aid, are we also going to be hostile to migration? Well, it might just be true that we're, we don't care about people in other countries at all, or people at all, and um, and that's. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Trump's platform is just America first. We don't care about anyone else. No migration, no aid, no trade, you know, nothing. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I mean, I think development people have been working hard to try to get people to care in any way they can about poor people, about their material needs, about their rights, about them as deserving of aid or deserving of the opportunity to migrate, anything that will stick to make people care more about poor people. I think that's been the agenda of the whole development 
so I, you know, I was aware of that, and that's, um, but that's that's a good corrective to assuming that only uh, you know only the Americans and and Europeans are the, the bad guys as far as xenophobia. Xenophobia is a pretty widespread phenomenon around the world, and as many incidents as ma in many places around the world, you mentioned Korea, South Africa being one of them. Hostility towards migrants is a very common phenomenon around the world. But also the stereotype of the U.S. and the EU, uh, the de desired places. Yeah, like yeah, absolutely. Nigeria, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kenya, and South Africa absolutely. are within the continent. Uh, yeah, that's that in itself is also a good corrective. The idea that you know we're so great, everyone wants to come to the U.S. and we, you know, we we have to you know ration out how you know this wonderful greatness of ours to be very limited to a, a very small number of people that we want to let in. And that's not even true because there are many other places that people do migrate to and can migrate to. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned the, <coughs> the movements within Africa. The, um, part of the Maurit story is actually also a story of migration within Africa. The Maurits have also gone to Gabon from Senegal and brought a lot of good things from Senegal to Gabon and a lot of trade links. Um, and of course, there are also many other places around the world that migrants are benefiting by going to. The Gulf, the Gulf states are another huge magnet for migration that is very seldom talked about in, in the whole migration story. So there's lots of other places that people are migrating to to gain, gaining, and it's not just like the one so-called supposedly wonderful uh, you know, image that we have of ourselves as Americans. In fact, actually migration, what's really bizarre about the recent surge of xenophobia in the U.S. is that migration is actually down in the U.S. You know, for example, across the Mexican border, migration is actually down because people are saying, hey, this is not so great what's happening in the U.S. Who wants to go there? You know, and that, so, you know, that's yet another stereotype that we should not all assume it's all about us as uh, rich Americans. Rich Americans should not assume it's all about us as rich Americans for the reasons you said. Yeah? Maybe you didn't want to go there, but um, how would you kind of put some of the phenomena that you were discussing um, in with what's going on in the U.S. right now politically? Um, well, what's going on in the U.S. right now kind of motivated me to want to give a talk like this. <laughs> um, you know, I think um, I, I, I honestly have not, that the next place that I really want to go in, in my own research is start, and I've started reading uh, the research of people like Raphael. I, uh, and many other political scientists have been way ahead of the economists in doing research on the determinants of, of migration attitudes and xenophobia and so on. And I, there's a wonderfully rich literature about that that I'm not the right person to ask about that. I want to to read that, that literature. And th maybe that will help us understand what's... But, you know, I think we, as... I, I'm sort of half academic, half public intellectual, that, that I feel an obligation, and I think lots of other public intellectuals feel an obligation to kind of you know, this is a major moment, what's going on now, this really scary resurgence of racism and, and white nationalism and xenophobia in the U.S. And I think public intellectuals, if they had something specific and concrete to say from their own specialty about that, they should, they should do that right now. And I think that's, that's what we should all be doing. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, you, are, you were emphasizing the role of individual rights when it comes to development. And I was wondering whether industrialized countries, whether they should actively promote those individual rights in some countries, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the question of how to promote individual rights in poor countries is, is, is it's not an easy one to answer, and a lot of the answers that you would like are the wrong ones, you know. <laughs> you, one answer I'm definitely not in favor of, and most economists are not in favor of, is invading some other co poor country to convey the blessings of individual rights and democracy on them. It's like, uh, it's an inherent contradiction that you invade another country and force them to be free, you know, which is free. <laughs> you know, we, we coerce you to have the right to be uncoerced, you know, I mean, it's, it's just inherently contradictory and it's, we've seen that it has disastrous, uh, uh, you know, fallout when you do that. So that's, a, that's, a, that's definitely not an answer. And I think that's part of the damage of the war on terror has been the, the the, um, the, the false credibility that's given to all these kind of fix and failed states, peacekeeping, nation building kind of efforts. Some, maybe some of them occasionally work, but most of the times they don't. 
difficulty of solving that problem of what to do about international in, in, individual human rights, political rights in poor countries. That's what's kept development economists from talking about rights. They say we, and I've heard many development economists say, say this: we don't want to talk about rights because we, there's nothing we can do about them. You know, so, but I don't think that's a good answer, particularly not in this context that we're talking about today. We should intrinsically care about rights, even if we don't immediately figure out what to do about them, because it will, the principle will, it, uh, just advocating the principle of individual rights will eventually, in some unpredictable way, in, in some other area, like today we're seeing, you know, the neglect of rights may have, have, have been costly, and, and kind of like, now that we have to deal with the resurgence of xenophobia, you know, if we had been kind of more on the ball of preaching individual rights, maybe we'd have a more credible answer as development economists to, to xenophobia. And so I think that's a way in which, you know, advocating rights just in general, even if you don't have a practical way to do so, advocacy is itself a powerful force for, for social change. It's very hard to measure it. It's very hard to empirically show what it does. But, you know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, it wasn't like Martin Luther King Jr. was asked, you know, like, well, what's the evidence that your whole I have a dream approach works? You know, um, you know it's, it's just like the, it's something that intrinsically changes societies about saying I have a dream. You know, and there are many Martin Luther Kings around the world that are now in jail and kind of not given voice by enough voice by development advocates. So I think if anything, that what we can do is advocacy and give voice to those people who are advocating for rights in poor countries, many of whom are in jail or in exile. I don't know what you want to do about time. How many more? One more question. Who wants, who wants to be the last question? You have to be very enthusiastic. Both hands in the air. <laughs> Anybody? Are you, okay, I, I have my eyes on you. So okay. You, so as you establish, some of the most. A lot, you have a lot of responsibility right now. <laughs> Try to deliver. Yeah. Uh, so, so as you establish some of the most predatory fundraising and sometimes some of the most effective and the attempt to kind of reform the conduct of the media and fundraisers seems Sisyphean at times. So given that, what do you recommend our kind of distribution of effort should be between making developed countries more hospitable to migration on one hand or reforming the conduct of fundraisers on the other? Oh, I guess, I guess I see the two as related. You know, I mean, I think Again, I don't, I don't know empirically how much effect the, the negative images created in the development world are affecting the hospital, the, the overall receptivity of xenophobia uh, towards, towards migration in rich countries. You know, they're, only, they're only one of them. But you know, the development world is a big source of images that get spread through, through movies and through, through you know, general media and so on. So I think that the development the development profession has some responsibility. And even if we don't know what the impact is, it has some responsibility just to be, you know, have integrity and respect for rights itself. You know, that a stereotype is intrinsically an insult to the dignity and rights of the people it's stereotyping by itself. Even if you don't, if you can't show that it affected someone else that your stereotype is, even if your stereotype didn't have much impact beyond your immediate circle, you know, still, the, the stereotype was already wrong. It was intrinsically xenophobic and, and, a, and a rights violation in and of itself. So I think that's the area that we can be most clear on. Just as you know, development economists and development workers and advocates, we can be especially careful that, that we ourselves show respect to the dignity and rights of poor people and that we do nothing that would contribute to any, any, any violation of that. 